Life gets a little more interesting if the temperature is changing with time. I took this same rig with uh, six temperature sensors, put it in the oven to heat it up, then took it out and let it cool to room temperature, and then put it in a freezer to see how these temperatures would respond with time. It was a huge file, and this is not something you're going to be able to process in a spreadsheet. But we can do the same kind of thing in our uh, uh, Python uh, notebook in, uh, in Jupyter. So read in a bunch of stuff. I've now got seconds, five temperatures, six temperatures in total. I can do the same thing that I did last time. Convert it to a NumPy array. And there's my temperatures. It's huge. It's 634,000 rows of data. So I'm going to pull out the first column, which will be time. The rest are going to be the temperatures. I'm also going to pull the labels off of this data frame columns variable. And I'm going to start at column one and go out to the end because I don't need the time label. I just want these labels. Then I can plot each of them in turn with a uh, label that corresponds to their column. And then I can put a legend on my graph. So if I run that, I get this graph here, which goes like this, and then it goes right back to zero. Now what's going on there is the uh, time in microseconds actually ran over the 4 billion mark and cycled around back to zero. So 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, up to 4 billion and some, and then it rolled over the integer value and back to zero. So to fix that up, we can run this little snippet of code here, which just goes out to a time greater than 3,000. And then if it gets a time value less than 3,000 any time after that, sorry, less than 2,000 any time after that, then it just adds on a number uh, corresponding to the 4 billion value. So if I run that, and then I do the same plot, This time it stretches out uh, and doesn't rush back to zero. It stretches out over time past the 4,000 second point. Oop, and what happened here? Oh, that should be labs I. We only want that particular column label, not all of them taken together. So there's the uh, temperature history. Uh, into the oven, heat it up, out of the oven to room temperature and down, into the freezer, and then back out of the freezer. Now if we calculate a mean on all of this data, or a standard deviation, it's not really very meaningful because it doesn't give us an indication of the variation over the short time. It gives us the variation in the actual real temperature that was involved. So when I run this next one, it takes a little while. The mean value about 44 to 46 degrees. So Somewhere in here is the mean, and a standard deviation almost as big, reflecting the fact that it went a long way above 44 and a long way below 44. So these are no longer characteristic of the noise or the uncertainty of our sensors. They're characteristic of how the temperature changed with time. It's not going to be really useful to do that. We'd be much better to try and figure out what was going on by averaging over a shorter period within that segment. So with this moving average calculation, we can go from uh, the beginning to the end while averaging over just a small chunk in the middle there. And if you follow these, they're going through the range. And then in uh, each area, they're taking this as only a small fraction of the total data. So with this moving average calculation we do, 
takes a while to get through those 600,000 uh, lines of data. But once it does, we'll see something that looks a lot like the original data, but smoothed out a little bit. And so zoomed in just on uh, this region of the graph in here around about 2000, we can see in orange our moving average, while the blue in behind it is the, uh, the raw data. So a moving average can help us smooth that out. And the difference between the raw data and the moving average gives us an indication of our uncertainty. Looks like there might be something weird going on in around uh, 2007. And if we zoom in a little bit more on that, with uh, this one here, instead of doing a moving average, I've been doing smoothing. And you notice it went faster uh, using exponential smoothing. If I zoom right in on this area here, Still not really showing up, but I can imagine I see a little glitch in there around 2007. But if I zoom in a little more, I can see that something definitely weird is happening right in there. There's a long period where I didn't get any data. And so using Python, you can interrogate your data in some more detail to pull out additional information. I'm not sure what was happening. Maybe the high temperature was causing problems. And with this code down here, I can go through the full range looking for gaps in time. Did the time jump by more than a quarter of a second between one time and the time on the next row? And I can identify other places where this happened. So if I run that, I get these values. And uh, sure enough, there's our issue round about 2007. And there are some other gaps in here where there was a quarter of a second glitch in our data. So the big advantage of bringing these huge data files into Python is that we can process them fairly quickly to extract information from the data and find out things we wanted to know. So you can try this with your data from Lab 2.